Hi guys, I'm back again. There we go, just switch the video back on as well and I am recording. Um, okay, so now we can have a quick look at Learning Unit 4 and um, we'll probably only be about half an hour with this because we do have to finish just a little bit before the end of, um, what time are we going to finish? Before 1 o'clock so that they've got time to clean the venues as well. Um, and that's fine because it's really the interest rates part of this learning unit that I want to spend some time on, which will be the last part of your foundational areas for this year. So time value of money, risk and return and interest rates, those are the foundation that everything else that you've got to do is built on. So if you spend time on understanding anything, that's what you must make sure that you understand. Okay, so interest rates and bond valuation, learning unit four. So when we talk about interest rates, okay, and this is if you want to follow in your textbooks, we'll be on page 95. Um, in simple terms, an interest rate, when we say the interest rate, we're really talking about an interest rate that we're looking at, say, perhaps it's the interest rate that the bank is charging me um, because I'm paying off a vehicle that I purchased on HP, or it's the interest rate the bank is charging me because I have a home loan with the bank. That interest rate represents an opportunity cost. Remember, that's a concept that you learned last year. To both the borrower and the lender, can you remember what an opportunity cost is? You guys that are online, do you remember reading about opportunity cost last year, in second year? In that section of the textbook, you learned about sunk cost and opportunity cost in the chapter that you were discussing relevant costs. Do you recall that? So just to give you a quick idea, an opportunity cost is the cost of the value that you have um, forfeited or given up due to the fact that you made a different decision. So if you have got a choice between two decisions and you choose decision number one, the benefit that you would have got if you had have chosen opportunity number two, that is the opportunity cost of choosing opportunity number one. So remember opportunity cost can't be helped, I mean especially if you're choosing, if you are choosing between two things there will always be an opportunity cost, it's not that as a financial manager you have to make sure that you never have an opportunity cost because there will always be one. It's the fact that as a financial manager, you weigh up the opportunity costs and then you um, choose to accept the opportunity cost that is going to be most beneficial for your company. So the interest rate represents an opportunity cost to both the borrower of the money, that's the person who is getting the money, and the lender of the money, who would, let's say in this instance, be the bank who is giving you the money, and it is determined based on the laws of supply and demand. So an interest rate is the price of money, just like you have the price of peas or the price of oranges, which in the middle of winter now you can get for 30 rand a bag, whereas right at the end of winter when they become scarce, they'll be 50 rand a bag, supply and demand. So in turn, interest rates serve to regulate the supply and demand, or movement of, in this case, funds in an economy. So if the government wants to regulate the supply, the, um, the supply and demand of money in the country, they will use interest rates to manipulate that. So we say that there's an inverse relationship between the interest rates and economic growth. Inverse means when one goes up, the other one goes down. So in this case, if interest rates are low, then 
the level of borrowing in the country will be high because money will be cheap so people will be able to obtain it. Borrowers have more money to spend in that case and then that will then fuel economic growth. So low interest rates will equal high economic growth or inflation. And then inversely, when interest rates are increased and increased and they become higher, money supply in the market becomes tighter and tighter as money becomes more expensive. And when that happens, the economy will contract a little bit and it will depress the economic growth. And then we have, well, hopefully not deflation, but it will just cool off any inflation that has happened. Because sometimes the government doesn't like too much inflation or too much deflation, which is why I'm sure you know that they have a target inflation rate and their whole manipulation of the interest rates is to maintain the country's inflation rate within those target limits, which um, for South Africa is somewhere between 3 and 5%, preferably on the lower side, on the 3% side. Although after this pandemic, I'm quite sure there is going to be um, encouragement in the market for that to increase. And I don't know if you guys have um, take, took note of that now during lockdown, but the interest rates have actually decreased twice during lockdown. The government decreased the interest, not the government, I shouldn't say, the Reserve Bank, which is not the government because the Reserve Bank is neutral and independent, decreased the repo rate twice during lockdown. And the express reason for that um, is, is this what we've seen on the page right here, to try and relieve the economic pressure that everybody is under at the moment. Okay, so the cost of money or interest rates, which is the compensation that the lender gets for providing funds to the borrower can be described by saying it's the interest rates, it's the cost of borrowing, or it's the required rate of return. All of that means the same thing. So we've already seen that we can calculate our required rate of return by using our CAPM formula, the previous learning unit. Okay. So that's how that all ties in there. And that this is important that these terms are interchangeable and they mean the same thing. It's important that you guys understand that and that you don't get bogged down when you're reading through the textbook and when you see interest rates or required rate of return or whatever, that you think you're referring to something different. You'll just use the different terminology depending on what the particular scenario is that you are discussing at that particular given moment in time. So the cost of money comprises three main elements. Okay, cost of money being your interest rate. This is very important. How, what makes up interest rates? So when you go and buy a car, they'll quote you an interest rate. How did the bank come up with that interest rate that they quoted you, that they're going to charge you over the five years that you're paying off your vehicle? There will be um, a basic or base rate of interest built into that, which is based on the repo rate, which is the rate of interest that the central bank charges the commercial bank. So that's usually what we then refer to as um, the real rate of interest. Okay, so how, what is that made up of? Taking into account there is inflation. So because we know that year after year, things become more expensive, and in the, the effect of inflation increases the value of things over time. We have to take that into account, which is similar to the time value of money because we say that as time passes, the value that money holds intrinsically changes, which is kind of like the same thing as the effect of inflation. But then in addition to that, we also have a risk premium. So remember in the previous, one of the previous slides, we saw that the risk premium is um, equal to RM, RM minus RF, you remember that? 
it is important that you remember that, guys. These things, if you can keep them in mind, you're going to make your life so much easier. Sorry, I've just typed in something wrong between I and M. Okay, so RM, market rate, minus RF, which is risk-free rate, equals the risk premium. So to take it down to its bare bones, if we had a world where there was no inflation and no risk, okay, which is what I call the naked interest, we are left with the rate of interest rate that an investor would expect to receive or a borrower would expect to pay. In other words, that's, his, um, that's purely his compensation for allowing you to use his money. That's the price of the money. It's his income. He's charging you rental for using his money. Okay. And that is called the real interest rate, the real cost of money. And then on top of the real interest rate, we then add to that the cost of inflation, the cost of time value of money, and a risk premium that will be specific to that particular person that we're lending the money to at that point in time. So the real interest rate reflects the real cost of funds to a borrower, and it excludes the effects of inflation. And if we want to calculate it, depending on what information we are given, if we are given the nominal interest rate, and remember the nominal interest rate, nominal means name, which is the named interest rate that the bank gives you when they say, I'm going to charge you 12% to lend this money to you. That's the nominal. Take the nominal interest rate, subtract the inflation rate, and what's left over will then be the real interest rate or the naked interest rate. Okay. So naked meaning I haven't put the clothes on it yet. I've got the naked interest rate, which is my real interest rate. And I'm going to put the jacket of inflation on that and the gloves of time value of money and then the woolly hat of risk premium. And then I will have the nominal interest rate when I've done all of that. So if we want to turn that into a formula, we say that I, if you look at the screen, I representing nominal interest rate is equal to R which is the real rate, naked rate of interest, plus H, and H is the inflation rate. And then to that formula, we also add then plus RP, which is risk premium, if there is a risk premium. And then they like to ask this question in the tests that you must calculate um, the nominal interest rate using the Fisher formula which is just a slightly more accurate way of calculating the interest rates. So th this is in your textbook on page 97. You guys can go there and just make sure that if they do ask specifically for you to use the Fisher formula, that that's what you use. And then one of our other learning objectives was that we have to understand the structure of interest rates. So on page 97, this is where you will find this, the term structure of interest rates. And this describes the relationship and behavior of interest rates over time and up to the date of maturity of the underlying borrowings or investment. So date of maturity, specifically in this learning unit, it relates to a bond. A bond is similar to a company obtaining a loan from the investor because bonds are only in existence for a specific number of years. So when you purchase a bond in the market, it will state that this is a five year or a 10 year or a 15 year bond, which means that the company only wants the use of your money for those 15 years. And at the end of those 15 years, they're going to give you your money back. So it is similar to a loan, but it's a structured in a formal contract that we call a bond. So when we say up to the date of maturity, the date of maturity is that the end of the 15 years. Okay. And we say that um, the relationship and behavior of interest rates over time, in other words, from the, from the inception of the bond till the end of the bond, if we had to graph that and look at it on a graph, that would be called the yield curve. 
Okay, so a yield curve is a financial instrument's yield to maturity, which means from the, the inception of that financial instrument until the maturity of that financial instrument, what interest rate did I earn over the lifetime of that particular bond? So also just terminology, a financial instrument, that just means it could be a share in a company, it could be a bond that I'm buying, it could be a loan that I've taken out with the bank. All of those are examples of a financial instrument. And yield to maturity is the annual rate of return that was purchased at time equals zero, the start of the instrument up until held to maturity the time that it ended. So this is going to be relevant when you look at bonds. And this relationship, which is called the structure of interest rates, is represented by the yield curve. So if you have a look at page 98, you will see an example of three different yield curves. And what that curve looks like will tell you about the relationship between the interest rate of your financial instrument over time. Okay. So an upward sloping yield curve, which is what we've got in that first graph, is called a normal yield curve. And that's basically indicating that over time, interest rates are expected to increase. If we've got a downward sloping yield curve, which is the, the third one, an inverted yield curve, that means that from today, time equals zero, up until maturity, we are expecting interest rates to drop. And then the third one is the one where our um, yield curve is flat, and that obviously then in indicates that we expect interest rates to be, um, to be horizontal, to be flat, to be unchanged during that time. And then we have got various um, theories that have been researched and papers written up by economists. When various people have attempted to explain why does the yield curve behave in that manner, and there are three different theories that you guys have to study and can be questioned on, and this is what you see here. It can be the expectations theory, the liquidity preference theory, or the market segmentation theory. So you could be of the school of thought that thinks that liquidity preference theory explains the yield curve. Or you could be of the school of thought that says expectations theory explains the behavior of the yield curve. So remember, it's just three different ways of looking at the yield curve and um, of explaining why they behave like that. So expectations theory is the one that implies that the slope of the structure of interest rates will depend on the expectation, so that's self-explanatory, of what the future interest rate or inflation rate movement is going to do. So in other words, if we expect interest rates to fall, then short-term rates are going to be higher than long-term rates. So then we will have an inverted yield curve. If the expectation is that interest rates are going to rise, then our short-term rates will be low and the long-term rates will be higher and then we will end up with the normal yield curve that we saw on page 98. Whereas liquidity preference theory, this theory basically explains why the yield curve slopes upward, which is what it generally does. So that's why it's called a normal yield curve because that's what we expect it to look like. And this refers to how easy it is to convert an investment into cash. So your specific investment that you are looking at, how easy is it to convert that investment into cash, which is called liquidity preference theory, because that states that generally investors would prefer to have access to actual cash sooner rather than later. Um, and if their access is going to only be deferred to later, they want to be compensated for this. So the later their financial instrument is going to revert back to cash, then um, 
they will want to be compensated for that. So long-term interest rates will be higher than short-term interest rates because they perceive less risk in the short term than they do in the long term. So that's how that explains the normal yield curve through liquidity preference theory. And then market segmentation theory. This one basically says that the market um, supply and demand is segmented into long-term and short-term interest rates. And that I, I can't look at the two similarly. So if, in other words, you get short-term borrowers in the marketplace and they only want to borrow money for a short term and then you get long-term borrowers who are, who, who are different animals. So they segment the market into short and long-term borrowers and then they say, that that will that these segments operate independently. Okay. Um, that you usually get at least one theory question on those different um, on those different. Uh, my mind has gone blank now. Um, different theories that explain the structure of interest rates. This was just where I have now added to the little calculation that we had before, and this is on page 101 in your textbooks. Remember we said the nominal interest rate is equal to the real interest rate plus inflation. So I equals R plus H. And to that we are now going to then add RP, which is the risk premium. So you can read about that on page 101, but I've already explained this um, to you on the whole, and hopefully you do understand risk premiums now already. Um, guys, from these, uh, let me just go and change the slides. Oh, I'm on the wrong screen now. I need to get to. Oh, there we go. It has changed. Um, oh, okay, actually, I think that was the last lot of slides that we had. Then this last section of your learning unit four, starting on page 103. Um, is on bonds. Sorry, just ignore that. I'm going to go back here. This is just misbehaving. Um, I hope my screen hasn't frozen. Okay, there we go. Hopefully that's going to work again now. There we go. Okay. So here, learning at four, bond valuation. Your learning objectives that you guys have to do here is you have to be able to discuss the key inputs, meaning all the variables that are used in the bond valuation formula. You must understand each one of those variables, okay, which is which which is an input, where it comes from, what it represents and where I will be able to go and find it or calculate it if I need to use it. Okay, so in other words, we're not just learning formulas off by heart and um, out of textbooks, we're just learning formulas um, as numbers and letters, but we are understanding each of those variables that make up our formula. It's extremely important with all of your formulas. Um, used in the valuation process. So remember what we've given here is that I, we have come up with a formula that if I add in all of my key inputs related to the particular bond that I am wanting to purchase, what my answer will be, which is the BO, will give me a valuation in RAND terms for the bond that I want to purchase. So it will tell me what that bond is worth. It will tell me the price that I should expect to pay for that bond. 
and we do this calculation and then we say that the answer that I get will indicate to me what I should pay for that bond. And then if someone is asking a higher price than that, then I'll know that they have added a premium on and I will want to ask myself the question why. Or if somebody is selling the bond for a price lower than that, then perhaps that indicates that it is a very good buy at the moment because the actual intrinsic value of the bond is higher. And then I know that I will purchase it. But remember, the theory is that you will not purchase a bond for more than the bond valuation. Um, but you might purchase it if it is um, priced lower than that. And then, as I said, uh, okay, so then you have to then apply the basic valuation model, which is your, your um, bond formula, to actual bonds. And you must be able to describe, explain in your own words, the impact of required rate of return, which remember we can calculate using the CAPM formula, and the time to maturity so that on bond value. So the time to maturity on my bond, so remember I mentioned earlier that a bond could be a 15-year bond, which means that when a company first sells that bond into the marketplace, they are selling it and the bond will exist for 15 years. And at the end of the 15 years, the company will pay back to the bondholder the value that they lent them in the first place. While you are holding on to that bond, you might decide that you want to cash up and you might sell your bond to a different investor. This might be five years down the line. So at that point that you want to sell your bond, there will be 10 years left to the maturity of the bond. So when that new investor wants to buy the bond from you, his key inputs into his basic valuation model, he will then use 10 years to maturity in his valuation model and not 15 years that you used when you first purchased that bond. Okay, so that's what they mean by time to maturity. And if there are only two years left for that, for that bond's lifetime to run, then the value for N in your bond formula will then be two. So just to remember that the value for N in your formula represents how many years remaining are there in the lifetime of that bond. And then remember I did say to you right at the beginning of today that yield to maturity is calculating break even return of the bond. So in that instance, in our formula for the bond, we are solving for the value of R because I want to know that given the current price of the bond and the number of years left to maturity, what will, what profit in, in percentage terms will I earn if I purchase that bond at the price being offered to me? Okay, so whereas the basic formula, I calculate the price that I should pay in yield to maturity, I am given a price that's offered to me, and I use that to calculate the value for R, which is my um, expected return that I will get if I paid that particular price for the bond. So it's the same formula, but just looking at it from two different angles. And then on page 106, you have got your formula for your bond. Um, and if you look at your textbook there, that's very important just to remember. So BO is the value of the bond at the date that I'm doing this calculation, and remember I can do this calculation at 10 different dates over the lifetime of the bond, um, is equal to PMT. So PMT, remember when we did um, annuities in Learning Unit 2, PMT is that equal annual value multiplied by, which in this case represents the periodic annuity. So the fact that I'm whole, I am the bond holder I will be receiving an equal annual payment from the company that issued that bond to me in the, in the form of interest for lending the money. Then the value of R is going to be the required rate of return. So what is my required rate of return? I'll calculate CAPM to calculate what that is, and then I will substitute that value into the bond, um, the bond formula if I haven't been given it somewhere else. 
N, as we said, is the number of years remaining in the life of the bond. And then the capital M is the, the, the capital value of the bond. So if the bond's basic value is 20,000 rand, in other words, it gave the company 20,000 rand, I'm lending them 20,000 rand in return for receiving interest over the next 15 years. That 20,000 rand is then the value for M. So because I've got a capital lump sum that happens at the end of the lifetime of the bond, and I have got an annuity, which is the interest paid to me annually over the lifetime of the bond, to calculate my bond value, I have to add the present value of the annuity which are the interest payments, to the present value of the lump sum, which is the capital value of the bond that will be paid at the end of the 15 years. So that's why your bond formula has got one formula at the front added to another formula at the back. Okay, so bond valuation equals present value of an annuity plus the present value of a lump sum. That's the most important thing to remember or to understand about your, your bond formula. And remember that all of those calculations come from learning unit two, which is why they were so important. So further than that, you must just work your way through these examples and questions. Example 4.5, question 4.4, and so on. Um, don't worry so much about page 108 and 109. Um, and then go, go on to page 110, where you are then, what happens if the interest is paid more than once per annum? So again, remember in Learning Unit 2, we learned to um, calculate present and future value um, if with more than one compounding period per year. So that's all we're doing here, is we are then building in that um, lowercase m, interest is compounded more than once per year. And our formula changes exactly as it would in learning unit two, and it becomes R divided by M to the power of M times N. And then for that, you do example 4.7 and question 4.5. Okay. So remember, you're going to do example 4.5 and question 4.4 and example 4.7 and question 4.5. And then the last section in the chapter is the discussion about yield to maturity, which I've explained to you is when you take the same formula, but then you are solving for R. Um, and we have to use, um, if you look at example 4.8, um, You can then also use a financial calculator to look at the top of page 113 and then do example 4.8 and question 4.6. And then you should understand yield to maturity. And then always, guys, your revision points at the end of the chapter, page 115 and 116, are always super important. And they um, often use those comprehensive questions then for your tests and exams. So that brings us then to the end of the first four chapters of your module. And um, then when I see you again, oh, sorry guys, let me just take a look at the date, 27, 28. I'm going to see you next week, Tuesday, the 7th of July. We will then have a look at a little bit more theory. And then after that, we will start looking at the actual test papers themselves. Okay. And don't forget to let me know if there's anything that you specifically want to be covered. And hopefully, guys, in the meantime, these sessions are um, helping you. Have you found them helpful to be going over this revision? Is it helping you? Those of you that are online now. Are you finding it helpful? Okay. All right, fantastic guys, I hope so. And don't forget to let me know if there's something specific that you want.